What really is the worst movie of all time? Because it's not Skin of Marink. Okay? That was a late night snoozer. This movie that I'm fixing to cover will have you baffled. Believe me. You see Jeter's homer on Saturday? The guy's got some swing there. Yeah, it was there. Yeah? yeah? It was a good one to have been at. It was. Spent my best years with the Marines. God gave me a gift to be able to help people to defend our country. I feel him calling on me now for this mission. There's a huge gaping hole, flames still inside. Can you believe this? What schmuck could fly a plane into the trade center? Maybe they ran out of gas or something. Now, the film I'm claiming is much worse than, you know, a Dahmer versus Gacy or The Room is this. Uh, it made more than two and a half times what it cost, and the quality is, it's, uh... Bro. Death Row! Yeah. Hey, how many times I gotta tell you? You gotta take your crew and your junk out the night. We got you, man. It's my statue. What are you, the statue police? It's a Jackie Gleason statue. It's not a bench. You don't care. He's dead, man. Get out of here. Get out of here. Now, I'm gonna try and be as respectful as possible to those this movie was based off of, even though it is a total pile of crap. It is not their fault. They probably just were behind the scenes, you know, watching it happen and like, yay, this is a great thing. Because, I mean, it is, rem never forget, I agree. But uh, it was made by Oliver, Oliver Stone, Oliver Stone, and uh, that's the main reason I'm talking about it at this point. I don't know anything about him. I know he's made very good movies, though, so there's no reason this one should be terrible. Real cops say it got it right. So I'm gonna let y'all make that decision. Oh, I can't believe this is happening! Not my own Please, well. The movie opens in the most cliche way possible. The only difference is the alarm isn't going off. He has trauma, it's not revealed yet. We'll get to that later. So after we get a couple minutes of McLaughlin getting ready for work and taking off, we proceed to get three entire minutes of establishing shots of New York. Now, I'm not opposed to establishing shots, you know, they they have their purpose, you know, to set the tone, scope, you know, especially in movies like The Dark Knight, you know, you get a real sense of Gotham. In a movie titled The World Trade Center, you know, one or two, and I think we got the gist of where we're at. We're then greeted with a Michael Pena solo. So now that we've got the fact that this movie does in fact take place in New York, and that fact has been shoved so far down our throat it feels like our esophagus might explode, we're given the date. We're given the date. At this point, everyone's arrived at the department. Nick's getting ready to call Roll, Amino, and Dom are in the back of the locker room having some banter before they get ready for work. After they get their uniforms on, Amino is assigned to post 3, whatever that is where he encounters a confused tourist, and we get one of the worst shots I've ever seen in any movie, ever. After this occurs, they transport the entire unit to the location. How the hell did the other tower get hit? She was listening to Hot 97 and they said it. What? Who gets their news from Hot 97? With Nick leading the way. And whenever they get there, it is some of the funniest content you could possibly imagine. After that intense shot of Nick running, he comes back and picks volunteers. It's very undramatic, and none of them seem to care. Who's coming? Step forward. I got it, Sarge. I'll go. There's just absolutely no fear in the air whenever they do anything. I'm with you, Sarge. After volunteers are selected, Nick leads them into Tower 2 where he is then told over the walkie-talkie by a bloodied-up police captain that him and his entire crew are fixing to die. When the tower starts to collapse, he rushes them into the elevator shaft. After the collapse, Dom is the only one that is mobile. Everyone else is crushed under rubble. He attempts to save a minnow, but he can't even lift it. 
So he proceeds to suggest, you know, going to find some help. And Nick responds with, No! No! So Dom's supposed to be panicked with his buddy under all this rubble. Meanwhile, Nick couldn't care if he was paid to. Dom's got his cover! Good. That's good. So while Dom continues to follow instructions, this happens. And if the way they portray his death is not hysterical enough, just wait for the reaction. I'm dying, really. Nah, no, you're not. Dom, nah, stop this. Dom's gone. Dom's not! I know. So at this point, everyone's wondering where does the movie go from here? You know, Dom is dead and both of them are buried under rubble. Well, I'll tell you where it goes from here. It goes from a shot of Michael Pena's face to the rubble of the attack, all the way up into space to a satellite, of course, so that we can cut to a montage of very sad, distraught faces all across the globe reacting to the tragedy. With a runtime of over two hours after that sequence, we then cut to some random diner in the middle of Wisconsin to get this line delivery. That fire there in Washington continued. Cut to another actor who took a hefty chunk of the budget, and you get a better sense of where this movie is headed from here. And that is an Armageddon type of thing. You know, you have the tragedy, but also you go back and forth with the family aspect. And oh my gosh, this one is somehow worse than Armageddon. This is the collapse of the second tower. And so now as we stand here, both towers, the tops of both... Now that type of reaction from an average civilian would have been hysterical. But we're supposed to believe that she is not just Amino's wife, but also pregnant. I guess I got called in. Can I get someone to drive you? Chaos visited upon this country to say nothing. Allison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After that conversation between the brother and the sister, we cut to family members of the people in the tragedy, and I mean, it is painful. You couldn't care less. No one seems like a real person. The only praise I could give it is when the police arrive, there's like one performance that is, it's the best in the movie. Let's be real. The only performance in the movie. No! No! We cut back to Nick along with a minnow buried under rubble doing absolutely nothing and you're expecting you know some dialogue worth anything and you get this you know that movie gi jane you know the part where the drill sergeant says pain is good pain is your friend i didn't see the movie followed by fireballs sarge i got fire here ah! Now look, I wasn't there the day it happened, so who am I to say? But I am related to a veteran who was in the Pentagon whenever 9-11 happened, and this clip confused him more than anything. Now the only reason I even bring it up is because from where I sit, it's a pathetic way to pad runtime. However, let's give him the benefit of the doubt again. But you think that's ridiculous. I couldn't find a single report of Dom's gun going off from fireballs. If you could find that for me, leave it in the comments down below. But yeah, the clip starts emptying that he tried to alert people with earlier in the film right next to Will's face. Uh, 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 holy shit! Uh, uh, Dom's gun took it off! The movie proceeds to play an intense game of setting hopscotch, starting with New Jersey, where we are supposed to believe that a minnow's wife is panicked on the phone with authorities trying to find out where he is. It's very basic. Did he go in or did he not go in? Ryan, why don't you tell me what's going on? No, I'm gonna keep her here. I wanna take care of her. After that supposed display of worry, we cut to Connecticut where we are greeted by Michael Shannon, staring sternly at a press conference held by George Bush. This is right before we get two lines the writers thought were way cooler than they actually were. I don't know if you guys know it yet, this country's in war. Pastor, I gotta go down there. New York. We then cut back to New York after that pastor and Marine Michael Shannon conversation at the church to a family that just appears to be watching the 9-11 attack. However, it turns out this is John's family, and no, I'm not joking you. The only reason you know is because of the mom. 
in the background. You saw her worrying earlier with the other family. And the movie then just begins to play flip-flop of panic of families, and it is agony. You better come here. Dad and Uncle Pat have a deal. If anything happens to one of them, they go and tell the other family. Is this a joke? And that's the real reason I'm at the mic today. Because I thought that was hysterical. Buckle up. We got confirmation. John went in. After that point in the movie, it cuts back to New Jersey with some, you know, nausea from baby. And I just, uh, I, I'm in agony. And it, the rest of the movie, it just feels like a series of scenes of actors seeing how bad they could perform and still make money. It's okay, baby. We gotta call a doctor. Give her something fast. What is happening to this world? And we're back in Connecticut where Michael Shannon's getting the shape up. The next scene is hands down the best in the movie thus far. It's not even good dialogue, but it's relatable dialogue, so we'll take it. But it's still a really funny scene to me personally, because it sounds like Nick is trying to pass off a New York accent, even though it's clearly Xanax. We got a little girl. It wasn't planned. It just it happened. Will then attempts to try and alert people with a pipe that is very loud, and that lasts a couple seconds, and we cut away. You vomit yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yesterday and today. And today. Well, it's good. It's good. Seems confusing at first, but then we cut to the wife's face and it's her, you know, reminiscing over John because he might be dead and she is just so panicked. Anyway, uh, this is hands down the worst scene thus far. I'm doing the review as I go along because I just can't take this thing all at once. It is a taxing watch. Police, fire, and rescue teams entered the towers, and there are fears that half of them are missing and feared loss. Oh my God. Showing you the rest of it would be unnecessary cruelty. I mean, it is painful. Stop it! Stop it for a minute, okay? I'm sorry, I kind of just needed to nail the, the point home. After that, we go back to Michael Shannon as a Marine. He is going to the Twin Towers after his fresh fade, and uh, it only lasts a couple seconds, only to go back to Ameno and Nick under rubble doing nothing. I'm gonna take a 3 8 shot. Okay. After that, we get nearly three minutes worth of nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean absolutely nothing. We're supposed to believe that Michael Pena's character is guilt-ridden and he's expressing that to Nick and Nick's expressing it back that he feels the same way and uh, yeah, you don't believe any of it because it's all awful and then at the end they start to panic because the ground starts to shake and it is laughable. We then cut back to the same scene that opened the film with Nick waking up, but not from an alarm, and yeah, no reason. Last 30 seconds, just, just baffled at certain points with this film. Shocker, they make it, by the way. Cut back to Michael Shannon as a Marine arriving at the Twin Towers, and we get whatever dialogue exchange this is supposed to be. This whole thing is crap, man. All guys are in there. They're dying in there. It's like God made a curtain with the smoke, shielding us from what we're not yet ready to see. I feel like this movie was constructed with the specific intent to avoid being reviewed, because it is so all over the place, it is almost impossible to talk about. It has been, at this time, two days since I last tried to record anything about this video. So, at this point, after that, whatever that was, we cut back to John's house with his wife. Looking at saws, looking at his tools, and then she gets a flashback. She gets a flashback to her son with Nick, and Nick looks with a smile, and then it cuts. 
just like this. Sarge, you know you never told me your wife's name. It's Donna. And I get what they're trying to go for. I understand. But considering we didn't even get a single scene between John and his wife, or a minnow and his wife before the catastrophe happened, I don't understand how or why this is being filmed. Because again, the runtime is two hours and nine minutes. You cut this scene, you have saved me a headache of trying to figure out why it's even in the film, and do me the courtesy of not treating me like a total idiot. I married the right one, you know? Uh, no. Me too. This celebration of matrimony goes on for nearly three and a half minutes, and no, I am not bullshitting you. Watch it if you dare. I'm naming the baby Alyssa. It's what Will wanted. Ladies and gentlemen, we have officially reached the funniest point in the film, if you could even call it that. Uh, yeah, I find it offensive to call this thing a movie, because... It's really just a cash grab off of, the, like, easily the biggest tragedy in the U.S., and uh, that's the reason I'm making the video. The next two and a half minutes is more padding of time. For why? I don't know. I've, uh, I'm done with that topic. I'm done talking about it, because I might explode. Uh, yeah, two and a half minutes nearly of her panicking, supposedly, and it's just hysterical. I mean, it is laughable. Your cell phone. I left it. I forgot it. Here. We left the house with no phone? And honestly, this scene is really confusing to me. Because I don't know much about the early 2000s. I was born in 03, but I know that phones were not a very popular thing. At least not ones we're used to now. I don't exactly know what she would learn from a phone. Like, you can't access the internet, at least not that I know of, from phones like that. The only thing I can come up with is, I guess, a phone call she wouldn't want to get. But then this happens. What are you doing? You gotta get home. The stupid light is taking forever. Come on. Don't ask me. I'm just the messenger. So she walks about, you know, like 10 meters, maybe less, only to get right back in the car. And yeah, they rush home, and she busts in the door to see if Will is okay and in there and she finds out he's not, and her reaction is just, it, it, it is like, it's like me waking up, or me not caring about something, nearly laughing. We then go back to the only two characters we can go back to, being Ameno and Nick, and uh, yeah, he's expressing, he, Ameno is expressing concern to John that, you know, he might die by the morning. And, uh, Nick is clearly not somebody you want to be in dire straits with. I'm gonna die. Okay? You die. I'm just gonna die. After that motivational speech, Michael Pena's character asks John if he could go over the walkie-talkie and, you know, tell the, the captain to tell his wife he loves her. Nick proceeds to do the same thing, telling his wife that he just loves her so much. And then the next scene is fixing to happen and I'm buckling up. So as you can see, a minnow meets Jesus real quick. And then we get this. Wow, what an underwhelming transition. We just met Jesus and now we're back with John's wife doing laundry. JJ, what are you doing? I told you before. We can do. There is what nothing if we, we can never do. see him again. Now you're probably thinking the same thing as me. A, that was pretty funny, and B, how would going to the Twin Towers help him find his dad? Great question. Alright, I'll go. Get out. I said I'm going. Now come on. So I guess John's wife, along with her son, is just pulling up to the Twin Towers just to find John on their own, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, after that, we go back to Ameno's wife, and I mean, I am baffled at whatever this is supposed to be. It's nearly two minutes of her just wandering 
aimlessly. She she starts in the dining room. She goes out to the street. I get it. She the shock, the denial. Except you don't believe any of it. It's just really really funny. Is Daddy coming home, honey? I don't know. We go back to Dave Carnes, Michael Shannon's character, looking for Nick and Will. And this is probably the best scene I've watched thus far. You know, I, I wasn't there the day it happened, so this could look laughable to others. But, uh, I mean, it looks like a bunch of wreckage. And Michael Shannon appears to be engaged, at least in the first half. And then there's an exchange between him and another, you know, first responder. And I have absolutely no clue why it's in the movie, because... Someone says stop, you don't stop. You don't hear him. Thomas. Burns. So after whatever that exchange was, him and that first responder go looking for Nick and Will for roughly 30 seconds before we go back to Will meeting Jesus. <laughs> and if you thought the shot of him meeting Christ was amazing, just wait for Nick's reaction. The most amazing thing just happened. I saw Jesus. He's telling us to come home. So after that emotional reaction to such amazing news, Nick proceeds to almost pass out. And I get it, they're bleeding internally, but from where I sit, it looks like Nick on a mattress just being lazy and not wanting to act. And uh, if you thought that was lazy, buckle up. People don't like me because I don't smile a lot. The next seven minutes is them finding Will in a Minnow, and it's hands down the best scenes in the movie. But it's honestly more offensive because the worst, like, worst, quote unquote, the least paid people on the project were the best actors throughout the entire sequences. Uh, and the the only other thing that happens in that seven minutes is the families get notified, and I mean, you have seen how the wives act, so I don't even have to talk about that. Hi, where's John McLaughlin? Mrs. McLaughlin? He's still trapped. They're working on him. This is not right. This is not right! The last 30 minutes is the reason this movie avoided getting chastised, up till now. The reason is due to the fact they're not bad scenes, but it's the same thing that I said before. I find it more offensive that the least paid people, at least I'm assuming compared to people like Michael Pena and big names like Nick Cage are getting paid, are m miles better than the wives, than Nick, than Michael Pena. That shouldn't be the case, but it is. And I, that's the reason I'd say it's more offensive. Although we do have one sequence where Nick is clearly actually trying, and then he goes right back to his old ways. Honey, the kitchen's not even finished yet. It's just necessary. I'm stuck. After that legendary line delivery, they eventually get John out, thank God. Flash forward to two years later after they reach the emergency room and we get the emotional performances from the wives. Cut to a reunion held in McLaughlin and the Minnow's name for their heroic acts, and the only reason that this scene is good at all is due to the fact the actual people are there, so it has, you know, some emotional resonance with the audience. And then they just throw a bunch of facts about what happened and how tragic 9-11 was, and the movie ends. I mean, they, I forgot to mention the scene where Olivia shows up and you're supposed to, like, be bawling your eyes out, and you're just not, because... I mean, she wasn't even born and you didn't see her before, but now Ameno has a kid, so cry. Uh, the end.